Hallelujah. Well, put your hands together and give God a shout and a praise in the house. Somebody say, I hear you. We are in the days of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we have to be spirit driven and spirit led. Like never before. Jesus was the word made flesh. The Bible said in the beginning the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And Elohim came on the scene and saw the state of the earth and that everything was covered by darkness. And he knew exactly what to do but did nothing until the Holy Ghost moved upon the face of the waters. And when the spirit brewed upon the face of the waters, then God spoke the solution and said, let there be light. And the word and the spirit came together and there was light. The word and the spirit having intercourse was the reason for the light. And the Bible said, and God saw the light that it was good. And then the Bible said, and God created the greater light by day and the little light by night. The sun, the sun, the greater light by day and the moon, a reflection of the sun by night. So the first light was not the sun and the first light was not the moon or the stars. And so if the first light was not the sun, the moon, and the stars, what was the first light? But the Bible said, there was a man who was sent to bear witness of the light, but he was not the light. And his name was John the Baptist. Then Jesus came and said, I am the light of the world. So the first light and the Bible said the light shined and the darkness comprehended it not. That first let there be light was Jesus himself. And the Bible said this is the light that lighted every man that cometh into the world. And Jesus I am the light of the world. Somebody say I hear you. And like never before Jesus came on the scene the word made flesh and for 30 years he moved the face of the earth and kept saying, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. Until baptism in the Jordan, when the Holy Ghost descended upon him and he was full of the Holy Ghost and driven by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness to be tempted or tried by the adversary. And after 40 days and 40 nights, being tested and tried eyeball to eyeball and shoulder to shoulder with the devil the bible said he returned in the power of the holy ghost and began his ministry that he wouldn't even touch the ministry without the holy ghost coming upon him and said to the apostles tarry in jerusalem until you receive what is on me because when I go to the Father, what I carry will come upon you. And when he comes upon you, greater works than I did will you do. Because the same anointing, the same anointing. Somebody say the same anointing. Oh, I'm not feeling you. Say the same, the same. The same anointing. Ladies and gentlemen, the anointing that Jesus carried and the Holy Ghost that Jesus had is the same Holy Ghost and is the same anointing. The Holy Ghost Jesus had is not different from your Holy Ghost. And it's not different from your anointing. It's the same Holy Ghost and it's the same anointing. If you believe it, somebody shout yes. My understanding of the adversary has nothing to do with what I read in the Bible. It's a personal experience of what I have encountered. I know how he works. Because I encountered the adversary in my own life. And I was in a room where I heard and saw demons and nobody saw them. 
And I was on that demonic attack and command and influence. And tonight, I come by divine authority in the volumes of the books to proclaim the unconditional release of every captive of darkness. That you can be loose tonight from the hold of the adversary. Unconditionally, you can be released from the power of the enemy. For whomsoever the Son shall set free, shall be free indeed. Hallelujah. Glory. And I like to say to you that things don't just happen. Please tell somebody things don't just happen. Things don't just happen. I think one of the deception of the adversary is to get us to believe that if you just get saved, you get born again, and you speak in other tongues, everything is going to be all right. And that kind of preaching that goes on like this, hold on a little longer. And everything is going to be all right. If you just hold on a little longer, everything is going to be all right. It don't work that way. And that is how come the adversary has seduced the church, bewitched the church, and veiled the church, and deceived us to believe that everything is going to be all right. And he is having a field day with the church. But in the name of Jesus, let the veil be removed. Let the blindness be destroyed in Jesus' name. And let the remnant rise up to the occasion. Say, I hear you. You are part of the remnant. I've been teaching about the end times and I was telling some of my folks that for whatever reason, it don't, it don't look like the church is ready for the coming of the Lord. It, look, it don't look like we're ready. And we don't know anything about eternity. It looks like we are just prepared to live here, to break through, to be successful. Being saved and being born again is more than success. As a matter of fact, you don't need to be saved to have money. You can have money without knowing Jesus. It's more than having money. This is too big. This is huge. And I was telling pastor that as soon as the headquarters or the capital of the nation of Israel moves from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, we have to get ready. Because there are two prophecies that is not yet fulfilled. That the gospel will be preached to every nation, then shall the end come and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. We are getting close than ever before. I'm not talking about the second coming. I'm talking about the rapture. I'm talking about the church living in the rapture for the seven years of the great tribulation and coming back after the seven years. And it don't look like we are ready. And I was telling my church, I said, you are not going to heaven because you are saved. You are not, it's not automatic that you're going to go to heaven because you are saved. You go to heaven because you prepare yourself. And the Bible said, he that has in him this hope. He that has in him this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. So you can't make it. You can't make the first flight if you are not pure. And the only thing that guarantees purity is the hope of his coming. But we have hope for everything and not for the coming of the Lord. I know you have a passport as a citizen of the kingdom of God. But you need a ticket. And the ticket is purity. And like never before, this flesh can only be brought under subjection with the hope of his coming. That we don't belong here. We're going somewhere. And he's coming back again. And whether you believe it or not, it is just what it is. One of these days, one of these days, he will step out of eternity into time. Are you hearing me, somebody? Lord God Almighty. I look forward for that moment and for that day. 
You know, when I was taken into heaven, left my body for 45 minutes. And one of the things that surprised me, apart from so many things, was the fact that there were so many people in heaven that made it to heaven but had no reward. They had made it to heaven, but they had no reward in heaven because they never did anything for the church that gave them eternal mileage. Everything was about them and their family, their kids. How many of you believe you are going to heaven? Please show me by hand. You going to heaven? All right. Who are you going to see when you get to heaven? You sure about that? Who is the head of the church? And if you have written your will and you didn't leave anything for the church, you are a disgrace. I'm just telling you as it is. Because you're going to meet Jesus. And the only reason why he blessed you when you were on earth was because of his church. He said, Jesus said, I'm building my church, not your business, not your family. He said, I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not stand a chance. So the only reason why we are kept alive, the only reason why he heals us, the only reason why he blesses us is for his church. Not for your wife, not for your kids, not for your loved ones, but for the church. So there is no reason why you must write your will, your last testament on earth. And you don't leave anything for the church. It showed clearly that when you were alive, you really didn't love God and you didn't care about his business. Because your last testament, what you put in your last testament reveals what you really cared about when you were on earth. And if you didn't leave anything for the church, then it's very clear that you fooled God, you deceived God, and you really didn't care for him. Because if you did, you will leave something for the church to make a statement to your kids and to your grandkids that I don't mess with God and I mean business with God. <laughs> Tell somebody things don't just happen. How many of you want to see a move of God in your time? You want to see a revival in your time? Yes. Somebody said to me the other day, how come you're always talking about revival and the move of God? It's the only thing that can answer and make sense out of the mess in this world. And he said to me, what is a revival? And I said, revival simple means when God comes to town. And when God comes to town, somebody leaves town. Are you hearing me, somebody? Say yes. If we want the devil to leave town, then let's bring God to town. Because when God comes to town, the devil leaves town. Somebody say yes. yes. Mm. And God don't come to town until we do what brings God to town. And please understand, I'm going to say some serious things tonight because one of my, one of my assignments to the body of Christ is to awake the church. That's one of my assignments. And so when I'm through with you, you can't be the same again. You just can't be the same again. I'm just telling you. By the time I'm through with you, I'm going to reprogram your thinking. You will be deprogrammed and reprogrammed. See, I hear you. Number one, I don't believe that God is in charge of this world. When I hear people say he got the whole world in his hands, religiously it's true, but biblically it's not true. It feels good to say he got the whole world in his hands, but it's not true. God is not in charge of this world. The devil is. Because if God is in charge of this world, then he has a lot of things to answer. God is not responsible of the mess going on. And the reason why the devil is having a field day is because 
he has succeeded to veil the church. And we just believe that God is going to do something, but God is not going to do anything about the situation until we do something about it. Please turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is in the image of God should shine unto them. That is the reason why a lot of folks are not getting saved. The reason why a lot of folks in our family are not getting saved, ladies and gentlemen, is because they've been blinded by the God of this world. That is one of his assignments. One of his assignments is to prevent people from getting saved. Number one assignment is to block people from getting saved. Number two assignment is to prevent them from serving God effectively when they get saved. And so people don't just get saved if we don't do what is required of us. You know, in Galatians 4.19, Paul said, My little children, of whom I travail again, again in Christ or in prayer till Christ be formed in them. Please look at it, Galatians 4.19. He said, my little children of whom I travail again in Beth until Christ be formed in them. So what does that mean? It means that number one, he travailed in prayer for them to get saved. And when they got saved, he travailed again in prayer for Christ to be formed in them. And the reason why a lot of folks are saved and they are in the church and they don't have Christ and they are not maturing and they're living like unsafe folks is because we don't have enough intercession going up on their behalf for Christ to be forming them. Galatians 4.19, look at it. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Again, again, that means he travail. For them to be saved and then when they got saved he travailed again for Christ to be forming them somebody say I hear you I hear you ladies and gentlemen I want you to look at me and please believe this that things don't just happen we want a move of God we want God to come to town we want to see the wonders of God and the miracles of God as we have read and we have been told these things don't just happen we have to pay a price and the reason why people are dying prematurely and the enemy is fooling with the church is because we believe that God is in control. He's not in control. God is not in control. Religiously, it sounds good and it makes me feel good. But biblically, God is not in charge of this world. The devil is. Come with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Luke chapter 4. And the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, uh -huh. showed him unto all the kingdoms of the world in uh -huh. a moment of time. Uh -huh. And the devil said unto him, uh -huh. All of this power will I give thee, uh -huh. and the glory of them. Uh -huh. For that is delivered unto me, uh -huh. and to whomsoever I will give it to. Now this is Satan speaking to Jesus. He said, Jesus, I need you to compromise. I need you to bow and give me the worship you give to God. And he said, you don't have to go to the cross and die. There is a short cut. If you just compromise your mission and assignment and give me God's worship, he said, the kingdoms, the power, and the glory of this world that you see was delivered unto me and to whomsoever I, Satan, will, I give it. Who delivered it to Satan? Who gave it to Satan? Adam did, not God. Adam ceded the dominion mandate to Satan. Somebody say the dominion mandate. Please say it again. Say the dominion mandate. One more time. Say the dominion mandate. God gave the dominion mandate to man and not to Satan, but to man. Ladies and gentlemen, in the Garden of Eden, before the fall of man, there was no need for prayer. Prayer became a daily necessity for daily triumph after the fall of man. 
Before the fall of man, there was no need for prayer. But when man ceded the dominion mandate to Satan, he now made Satan the God and the governor of the earth. And the only thing that overrides Satan and Adam's leash and gives heaven authorization to intervene on the behalf of man and in the affairs of man is prayer. Prayer is the invitation. Prayer is that which summons heaven to step in the equation and to enforce God's original intent for humanity. So when we don't pray, we allow the adversary to do as he pleases. Prayer is the vehicle that brings out of eternity into time the original intent. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray after this manner. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then he said, thy kingdom come. He said, we don't teach the kingdom to come. We don't preach the kingdom to come. We pray the kingdom into manifestation. <laughs> thy kingdom come, then thy will. Thy will. What does that mean? Your original intent, your original agenda, as it is in heaven, be done on earth. It is prayer that enforces and superimposes God's mandate, kingdom, will over the enemy's agenda for humanity. And when we don't pray, God is limited to what he can do for humanity. John Wesley of the Methodist Church said this. He said, it seems to me that God can do nothing for humanity until somebody prays. Then Queen Victoria of Scotland in the 18th century said this. She said, I am not afraid of all the armies of Europe put together, but I fear the prayers of John Knox. And John Knox prayed and said, give me Scotland or I die. Where are the John Knoxes of today? Where are the John Knoxes of today? My God, my God, that God will raise you and I as the John Knox of our day, that the political powers that be will recognize that there is power in our prayers, that they will be afraid of our prayers, that they will bow their knee to our prayers and say like Queen Victoria said, I am not afraid of the armies of America, but I fear the prayers of the church. Come on, somebody put your hands together and shout yes. There was a man in the Second World War by the name of Ritz Howells. And Ritz Howells, they called him the great intercessor. He wasn't a prophet, he wasn't a pastor, he wasn't a deacon. He was just a member of the church. But he was a great intercessor. And one day he was praying. And he said, he said, I have a feeling, I have a witness, that the armies of Britain are in trouble. They are surrounded. They are bound to be destroyed. And the media said, they are okay, everything is fine. And Reese Howard said, no, something is wrong. I have a witness in my spirit, in prayer, that something is wrong with our soldiers. And as he prayed and interceded, it was revealed that 300,000 of the British army were surrounded by Hitler's soldiers ready to be killed and there was an intervention by some kind of providence by some kind of providence all 300,000 escaped from the hands of Hitler's soldiers and returned to Britain and told their story he announced to Winston Churchill 
the then prime minister of Britain in the 40s that Britain would not be invaded when the invasion of Great Britain began he said Lord I have told the prime minister that Britain will not be invaded and the invasion has begun and the Lord said to Rhys Howells what do you want and he said I want the invasion of Britain to be aborted and I want you to send Hitler's army to Russia study history you see it and the Lord said to Russia shall they go the 300,000 of the British army that were delivered were delivered at the battle of Dunkirk you can google it the battle of Dunkirk is in history and as he prayed a word came from Hitler about the mission of Britain and attack Moscow he wasn't a prophet he wasn't an archbishop he wasn't an elder he wasn't a deacon he was an intercessor he was one that knew how to stay in the throne room of Elohim Lord have mercy how I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God at the anointing of intercession, the Spirit of grace will come upon you like never before to stand in the gap for the end time anointing, for the end time commission, for the end time harvest. Somebody lift up your hands and talk to the Father for one minute. Kodabahasa, Shadahalakustisis, Leikadilakadavant, Viveikilosualahasis, Amen. Amen. Tell somebody things don't just happen. Please believe me. There is nothing like accident in the spirit. When I hear there have been an accident, there is nothing like accident. 22 years ago, I was in an island called St. Thomas. In the Virgin Island. And I stay in a hotel called Sugar Bay. Speaking for a friend of mine. Dr. Leo Collimore. And there was a hurricane coming to St. Thomas. By the name of Hurricane Lewis. The night before I decided to leave town with the last flight. And the Lord said I want you to stay. And I said no I'm not staying. I'm coming from the jungles of Africa. I don't know what a hurricane is in Africa. We've never seen one before. I don't want to see it. I'm getting out of here in the name of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And the Lord said, you need to stay. I want to show you something. So I said to Dr. Collimo, I was going to stay. And he said, he said to me, he said, my friend, if you stay, you can't live here for days. This is bad. When it happens, everything is shut down. Electricity, everything goes off. So if you want to go, you have to leave tonight. I said, no, I'll stay. And I, I said it not with faith. Because he can tell, he can tell that I wasn't, I didn't believe what I was saying. So I stayed. And at 12 midnight, the spirit said to me, get up and walk to the terrace. So I went to the terrace and the spirit said to me, stretch your hands over the waters. And I did. And he said, now speak as I command you. And the spirit said to me, the spirit said to me, speak to the beast sitting and driving upon the wings of the wind. That the wind have wings. And something is driving it. And he says, speak in the name of Jesus and command the wind to change course. And I spoke as I was commanded. And the wind was coming the next morning into St. Thomas. Suddenly, on CNN, 22 years ago, I heard the commentator said, something strange, strange. It's losing its momentum and power and it moved from the shores of St. Thomas and went to St. Martin. And 
I learned a lot out of that. How to speak to the wind. To speak to the weather. Somebody say, I hear you. The reason why there is no revival and move of God is because, ladies and gentlemen, the church has gone to sleep. And we are expecting God to move, but God is not going to move. The Bible said, what thing soever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What thing soever you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So God is waiting on you and you are waiting on God. So nothing is going to happen. Tell somebody things don't just happen. When I hear about accident and I hear about hurricanes and all these natural disasters, we explain everything. I don't know if you saw Hurricane Matthew. CNN showed a picture of Hurricane Matthew. And you see the face of a beast. You saw it, that monster? Red, green eye. Driving the wind. And they call it hurricane. It wasn't a hurricane. It was an evil spirit. A beast. That had deployed the force of nature. Because the church don't understand the rules of engagement. We have allowed the enemy to take what God gave us against us. He's using the dominion mandate that God gave us to destroy us. And the Bible says my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. We lack illumination because one of the tricks of the enemy is to fail us. Is to blind us. Things don't just happen. When you hear about an accident, it's not an accident. It's a physical manifestation of that which was hatched and given birth to in the spirit that happened in the natural. And we call it an accident, but it's not an accident. It's a demonic pregnancy or conception or programming that was hatch in the womb of time and it was time sensitive lift up your right hand say in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. I, intercept I intercept every time sensitive, every time sensitive. Pregnancy. pregnancy programming, programming. Conception, conception against me, against me. The, works the works of my hands my health my, health. my, children. my children my family my loved ones, my community, my finances, my investments, in the name of Jesus, I intercept every pregnancy in the womb of time that is time sensitive. In Jesus' name, I terminate it. Just as Mary was pregnant and Elizabeth was pregnant, the enemy also gets pregnant. Look at Hosea chapter 9 and the 13th verse. Hosea 9 and the 13th verse. There are so many pregnancies in the womb of the enemy, in the womb of time. And those pregnancies are evil imaginations and evil expectations, evil desires. God said, I know the thoughts I have of you. They are thoughts of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. So God said, I don't have an evil thought of you, but the enemy does. God said, my thoughts towards you are thoughts of what? Good. The opposite of that is the enemy thoughts of you and I are evil. Say, I interrupt. I interrupt. Every evil thought in the womb of the enemy Concerning me and my family. Hosea. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Uh -huh. Give them a miscarrying womb and dry beasts. Give them what? A miscarrying carrying womb and a dry breast. What is the breast for? The breast gives nourishment to the child. So the prophet said, whatever they are carrying in their womb, 
let it miscarry let it backfire and if by any means we miss it and it's born dry up the breast so they will not have nourishment to keep it alive the problem with the church is we don't know how to pray and we don't know how to deal with the adversary ladies and gentlemen things don't just happen I'm telling you there is a mastermind behind the scenes working in the shadows working in the dark when you watch a movie you see people acting they are acting but the real people that control the movie are behind the scenes the people acting are following a script and they are being directed and the directors you don't see them they are behind the scene a lot of the things we see happening around is not those you see acting is somebody directing them behind the scenes in the name of Jesus Christ the Son of God we go behind the scenes and we bind every adversary behind the scene responsible for characters and attitudes and things that are not us say yes, yes. Jesus said to Peter he said your name is Peter and upon this revelation of who I am I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not stand a chance and few chapters after that the Bible said and the devil deploy the same vessel the same vessel that God used was deployed by Satan the same vessel say the same the same the same you see whoever you yield to become your master so he yielded to God one minute another minute he yielded to Satan same vessel and Jesus turned around to rebuke Peter but when he turned to rebuke Peter he saw Satan in the shadows and he went past Peter and said, Satan, leave him alone and get thee behind me. We have to go past people. We have to go past the root and the branches. We have to go past the tree and the branches and get to the root. We have to go behind the scenes and find out who is responsible of what's going on. Who is working behind the scenes? Who is responsible of the mess and what's going on in this community, in this church, in this family? Who is working in the shadows? Tell somebody things don't just happen. You want a move of God? You pay the price. Let me show you some few scriptures and then we'll pray. Acts chapter 12 verse 1 to 10. Acts chapter 12 verse 1 to 10. If you stay with me a little bit longer, you, you will get it. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Uh -huh. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He killed James. That is premature death. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. The then devil is killing a lot of God's kids. And the religious people are pleased with it. Go ahead. Then were the days of the unleavened bread. Uh -huh. And when he had apprented him... But he put him into prison, and he delivered to for him to four courts to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Satan had a plan. Peter, had therefore, plan. was kept in prison, but, yeah. pr but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Uh -huh. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping. The same night. The same night. Somebody... Tonight and tomorrow morning will escape premature death. Whatever plan the devil has for you and your family, you are about to escape. Somebody say, divine, escape, 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 escape. Say escape in the name of Jesus. Say yes. We live in difficult times. And as never before, we need the Holy Ghost than ever before. We need to be spirit driven and spirit led than ever before. Somebody say, I hear you. Please read on. Look at something. 
And as Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Uh -huh. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which it was done by the angel. But thou, but, he, but thought he saw, they were past the first and the second word, they, the ward. They came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Look at me, folks. James was mad at because the church wasn't praying at that time. The church was having a honeymoon, self-indulgence, making each other happy, having a good time. And the enemy vexed the church and took James, the brother of Jesus, and slaughtered him. And he went for Peter. And the church said, not this one. Somebody said, not this one. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. And the Bible said, and the church lifted up prayer unto God for Peter without ceasing. Ladies and gentlemen, the only reason why Peter escaped death the next day and was delivered was because the church prayed unto God without ceasing for his release. If the church hadn't prayed, Peter would have been assassinated. Did you hear what I said? Do you know how many Peters in the church are dead? Buried that are supposed to be alive because the church did not pray without ceasing. The spirit of Herod is still alive. And the spirit of Herod is looking for the leaders of the church to kill them. And as an, listen, Peter was very anointed. He had the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He had the keys to lock and to open, to bind and to loose. He had the ability to bind the bindables and to lose the losables. And yet, he was in prison, bound with chains. Do you know how many leaders are bound in chains? In all kinds of imprisonment, financial imprisonment, emotional imprisonment, marital imprisonment, all kinds of imprisonment. They are bound. And until the church rise it up and stand in the gap and go to the throne room, they will die prematurely. And go to heaven without fulfilling the assignment because the church didn't pray. You can look at me with that Tampa look. <laughs> but I'm going to give it to you as it is. <laughs> Don't just be excited of this preacher here and his wife. You have a responsibility to keep him alive and to keep his family alive. And how do you do that? You stay in the throne room of the Father and you tell the devil, not this one, not this one. Wrong address. Are you hearing me, somebody? Keep your hands off. Somebody say, take your hands off, Satan. In the name of Jesus. The only, hear me. Let me tell you, the only reason why Judas died and didn't make it was because nobody prayed for Judas. Peter, Peter denied Christ three times. Judas, once. But Peter lived because Jesus said, Peter, Satan have desired to have you. Do you know how many people Satan desire you? That word desire you means he has a strong expectation to have you. Do you know how many folks Satan desire to have them in the church? He desire to have our loved ones. He desire to have our kids. Satan has a strong desire for those who are promised seed among us. Those carrying great anointings and mantle, he desires to have them destroyed. But Jesus said, 
I have prayed for you. Who prayed for Judas? Nobody did. The only reason why Peter made it was because somebody interceded for him. The only reason why Peter did not die in prison the night before was because the church prayed without season. Tell to somebody and say, who is praying for you? Who is interceding for you? And you know why we are not praying for one another as we ought to? Tomorrow I'm going to show you something. Prayer as a lifestyle. You know why other religions are doing better than us? Other religions are advancing because they understand the rules of engagement. The Jews pray three times a day. The Muslims five times a day. We are the only religion that don't have a prayer life. Our prayers are not regulated. We pray anytime we feel like praying. And that's why the enemy is messing with us. Every revival you've heard of, whether Azusa Street Revival, it was a product of intercession. The Wales Revival, it was a product of intercession. Every revival came as a result of intercession. No revival came by good preaching and good teaching. If revival comes by preaching and teaching, then America will have revival in every community in America. Because you have 24 hours television in America. Look at all the Christian networks you have and all the teachers and the preachers you have. Yet, America is spiritually bankrupt. You have all the great buildings and all the two steps in finding the law. Seven steps in laying claim and hold. You have all the keys and yet there is no revival. You see this mama here? See this mother here? Ask her the story of the church she'll tell you. You see this kind? You see them with gray hair like that. They know something. And let me tell you what they know. They don't know everything about the scriptures. But this kind, they go and bow at the altar. And they cry out and they say, Lord, somebody needs you. That young man needs you. Touch, oh Lord. And God moves. Today, we have people that know every scripture in the Bible. And yet they don't know how to cry out. And they don't know how to touch God. And they don't know how to get hold of God. Something is wrong. I'm just telling you. Hear me. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm tired of being told what God did in the days of A.A. A. Allen. I'm tired of being told what God did in the days of Jaco and in the days of Alexander Dowie and John G. Lake and Catherine Kuman. I'm tired of being told what God did in the days of Lester Samuro and in the days of Ora Roberts and in the days of Papa Hagen. This is my day. I need to experience God for myself. Somebody put your hands together. Shout yes. Somebody say, Lord, Lord do, it again. do it again. My God, my God. You know what it's going to take? You know what it's going to take to touch our kids? It's, it will take more than preaching and teaching. It's not preaching and talking. They need an encounter. They need an experience with God. Somebody lift up your hands and shout yes. The talking is too much. It's time to stop talking. And let people begin to have an experience with God. It's time to summon the people who belong to this house to come forth. Wherever they are, we summon them in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, come forth. Say, come forth. <clears throat> Let me show you one more scripture. I have a lot, but I'll just give you one. 
Come with me to the book of Acts chapter 16, the 25th to the 27th verse. Acts 16, 25th to the 27th verse. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And, and at midnight, when people worry, tossed from one end of the bed to another, can't sleep, trying to figure out everything, Paul and Silas prayed. What do you do at midnight? When people are watching TV and they start at midnight, Paul and Silas said, it's time to connect with heaven. Watch it. See what happened. And as they sing praises unto God. In you see, the watch this. The first thing is, watch this. I preach in a lot of African-American churches and I tell them I love praise. I love praise. But watch this. Praise is a product of answered prayer. So you can praise as much as you want to, but if you don't pray, you can praise and scream and holler and you will not have answers. The Bible said they prayed and then they praised. So praise is a product of answered prayer. We praise God for what he has done. We worship him for who he is. Go ahead. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Hear me. Say, nothing just happened. Things don't just happen. Say, things don't just happen. <laughs> Say, things don't just happen. <laughs> they prayed, they praised, and there was what? A suddenly. There are no suddenlies in the church anymore. Where are the suddenlies in the church? There are no suddenlies. Why? Because we are not praying. We are not praying as we ought to pray. So there are no suddenlies in the church anymore. Go ahead. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So great the... earthquake. <laughs> Shout it. <laughs> Where are the earthquakes? No more. Why? We aren't praying anymore. Go ahead. And the foundations of the prison were shaken. The foundations were shaken. Foundations are not being shaken anymore. Until recently, you have a new leadership and foundations have been shaken. Oh. What used to make sense don't make sense anymore. You can't predict this. You can't tell what way it's going. Uh -huh. So now, God is making foolish wisdom the foolishness of the knowledge of man the only thing that will work in this time is revelation illumination if you can't hear from god you are going to be confused because we are used to knowledge what makes sense and knowledge comes by education but wisdom comes from god so you can go to school for a hundred years and you can never have wisdom. All you have is knowledge. But if you want wisdom, you got to humble yourself and acknowledge God. Because wisdom comes from God and not from education. Finish it. And immediately all of the doors were open. You see, you know why we don't have open doors anymore? We don't pray. Open doors. All the prison Doors was what? Open. Say prison doors. Open. Somebody say prison doors. Open, open. In the name of Jesus, open. The reason why there's too many closed doors in the church is because folks aren't praying anymore. Paul and Silas prayed and the prison doors of others were open. Not just this. If you will pray as you ought to pray, your prison door and the prison doors of others who don't know how to pray will open. There will be so much open doors in the church that there will be no need in the house. Say, I hear you. Come on, talk to me. Say, I hear you. Finish it. And everyone's bands were loosed. Everybody's chain was what? Loose. Somebody shout freedom. freedom. 
Somebody shout freedom. Freedom. Shout freedom. Freedom. Lift up your hands. Put down your Bible. I need you to begin to talk to the Father in other tongues. Sadakahas. Sadakustila kadabasi dakos. Leramuduka si kabahadasa. Sedele credo kusiki dalabro.